Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 2 series. The topic is Understanding Self. Jesus discusses Deconstructing the Facade Self. Filmed on the 30th of July 2014 in Monterey, New South Wales, Australia. This is part two. Okay, well, I labelled the... Uh, I, so we're right, we're labelled the discussion about sin because I wanted you to understand the seriousness of an unloving thought, word or action. So hopefully now you get the idea of how serious it is and therefore maybe have a bit more motivation to want to undo them, <laughs> to actually do something about them. Right? So it's very important that we see these things. So... God's not punishing us for our sin. However, all the laws of God are operating to correct our sin. And this is where pain and suffering results. Every time we choose to sin, we are choosing to do an unloving thing. And pain and suffering is always the result of an unloving action or thought or word. And, unloving, and all of these unloving actions, thoughts or words come from unloving emotions within us. They are seeded within the soul from unloving emotions. So we need to understand that. Okay. So where do you think we would start if we have to deconstruct the facade? Now remember, this is going to be the same process if we deconstruct anything that's in the soul. So, so it's really important to learn this process or at least understand it to a degree, even intellectually. Eventually, you'll understand this process in your heart, like you'll get it inside of your heart. But initially, you won't get it inside of your heart. And in fact, you might find today, after this discussion, that you feel very confused. Right? And that's a lot of times the result of this kind of discussion. But where do you think you start? It's, it's, so it's, where do we start? If we go to Pierre. Uh, behind Pierre, yeah, thanks. Pierre, I would start making a list of all my addictions. Yep. And yeah, trying to to find out all my addictions. Well, I think that's the second part. There's a place where you start before then. Actually, should we try Glenda as, she, as the mic goes past, and then we we'll come down in front? A recognition. Well, before you recognise something, you're in a place of? Denial. Denial. That's where you start. <laughs> Can you see why I've said to start there? If we come down to Daniel. <coughs> Daniel, because we're already there. That's where we already are. And haven't we always said, <laughs> the entire week so far, start where you are. Recognise where you are. This is where we are. With, most of, with almost all of our facade, we're in a complete state of denial. And with all of our addictions, as you'll learn tomorrow, you're probably also in a complete state of denial. Yeah. If you weren't in a state of denial, you'd already probably be trying to do something about them. So the fact is that we start in a complete place of denial. Neither intellectually or emotionally aware that the facade and the sin, of the facade and the sin it creates. Right? That's denial. That's where we are. It's very important that we get that. See, most of us... Most of us think that we're aware of everything going on within us or we like to believe we we're aware of everything going on within us. But we're not. We need to admit that we don't. That we don't know. We're not aware. That we're actually in a place where we want to not be aware even. Yeah? So we need to admit that to ourselves. 
And remember, sin is the unloving thoughts and words and actions driven by the denial of unloving emotions. Once you start accepting unloving emotions, you will find that you'll sin far less. You'll realise, ah, oh, here it goes again, another unloving emotion, and you won't act upon it. Right? Not because you're using willpower, but because you don't want to act upon it anymore because you know that it creates sin. You know the results of acting upon an unloving thought, an unloving emotion is always going to be an unloving thought, an unloving word or an unloving action. You know that it's going to hurt you, hurt other people. You know it's going to damage your relationship with God, so you don't want to do it anymore. At the moment, you want to do it still. And this, this, this is a place to start, the fact that we want to do it and we want to deny that we're actually sinning. Yeah. Thanks. Free you wait for Mike. Sorry, AJ, something from the sin of uh, towards others. I just um, don't seem to get... Can you just get... for everyone say your name? So that, cause oh, I Karina. Karina. I'm so sorry. You haven't, I don't think you've, you've only had one answer before, I think, Karina. Everyone okay. wouldn't know you. That's all. Thank you, uh, yep. Karina. Um, in the last session, you st I've heard you say that when I commit sin towards another, mm -hmm. I hurt... I damage their soul twice yeah and so i know that i damage my own soul i know that i no you actually them. damage your soul whatever you've damaged their soul plus whatever you've done to your soul yes hmm. now um i understand the first damage is that i'm overriding their free will yes and and hurting their soul is yeah. the second one that I'm also breaking God's laws? I'm not sure what the second thing is. Well, no, the, there's a long list of things. If we look at it analytically, there's a long list of things we're doing. Mm. But, but if, in the example I gave, you take the action that's the sin itself, which is yes. damaging you and them, but then the fact that you took it with another person means that you're now also harming their free will, which is another damage you do to them. Yes. So the, the original sin is the first damage and the harming of the free will is the second. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Of course there's also other damages because quite often when you sin you're damaging lots of things all at the same time and of course there are going to be effects for all of those things you damage. So, so don't then go, oh I'm damaging twice. No, it's actually more than that. I'm just saying the original sin, whatever the damage the original sin creates, which might be a hundred things that it creates, that's damaging to the person. Does that make sense? Yes. So for example, when, when a parent beats the child, there's a lot of damage that's created. It's not just a simple beating of the child where the child just feels the pain of the physical beating. Uh, you know what it's like. You feel terrible as the child. You feel like somebody hates you. you feel... There's all these long list of things that are created, right? So that's what I would classify as the sin, the original sin that you created. Then on top of that, because you did it with another person, you also damage their will. You damage their free will. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. Good. Any other questions there? Yep. If we come, Jennifer, is it? Yeah, Jennifer. Thank you. I had this question the other last week. If I'm going in and out of denial. I'm so unaware. It mm. just—it's automatic. Mm -hmm. So if I've got to start in a place of denial, but I don't know if I'm in denial. Mm, this is a problem. I have a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big problem. Most of us are in denial that we're in denial. <laughs> yeah. So I'm feeling like that. This is a huge one for me. So. Yeah. Becoming aware that you are in denial is very important. See, mo most of you haven't done that even that first step. A lot of you think you've resolved issues you're completely in denial of. Right? And you're not even aware that you're in denial of it. This is the first point of awareness. You need to become aware that you're in denial of things. You know, and, if you, and if you see that everything that you're denying inside of you is creating your sin, you'd be much more serious about finding out what I'm denying, wouldn't you? If you knew that everything you're denying creates sin. Because remember, he's saying here, sin is all of the things that are created, driven by denial of unloving emotions. 
So every time you're in denial, you're creating sin. If you understood the seriousness of sin, you wouldn't want to do that anymore, would you? So then you would start wanting to know, wouldn't you? So you'd be starting where you're at and admitting that you're in denial. Yes. And that at that point, you haven't even wanted to know. Okay. You haven't Thank even wanted to. You haven't even wanted to know that you were committing a sin even. You haven't even wanted to know that other people, yourself, were all being damaged. You haven't wanted to know how the environment around you is being harmed by your choice to stay in this place of denial. You haven't even wanted to know any of that. We need to want to know that before we make the next step. Thank sense? you. Thank yeah. you. So what's the next step? Intellectual awareness that the unloving behaviour, the sin, exists and is real. Now this is just now the first section of these awarenesses are intellectual only. Right? Because there's very little, generally very little emotion initially coming up at the in these stages. We're just sort of thinking about things and looking at it from an analytical perspective. Does that make sense? So for example, if we were taking the example of eating meat as an example of sin. So we start off, we, we're eating meat, right? and we believe we're in our rights to do it. So we're in complete denial of the sin. Does that make sense? So there we are, that's where we're starting, in denial. Now this step says we need to become intellectually aware that the unloving behaviour, sin, exists and is real. So what would we do? We'd have, to, we'd have to sit down intellectually and start working out why is eating meat a sin? So then we could start looking at what happens when we eat. So that's when you might watch a movie like, uh, you know, the... Earthlings. Earthlings, yep. Yeah. Uh, or some other kind of thing like that. Or you might go along to a slaughterhouse and see how they do things and all those kind of things. Because you're educating yourself at this point. You're trying to become intellectually aware. So this is an educational process from an intellectual perspective. You're trying to become intellectually aware of how eating meat affects not only yourself now, but everyone around you, the environment and so forth. So you'd read up on it, you'd study it, you'd look at it. So, so some of the things you'll find out are things like, so under, underneath this second step, which is the awareness of the sin, so it's awareness of sin, we've already got that there, so how would, so I'd rub that off and say, okay, what would we become aware of? Of all the damage that eating meat does. And if we're truly investigative with that, we'll find that it damages the environment. Right? We'll find that it damages the souls of the people who have to slaughter animals every day. They become, if you've ever met a person who's worked in a slaughterhouse, they become very, very desensitized to the animal's pain and suffering. They have to become like that. To de even work there, right? And, that, and you, if you meet people who work there, you, this is what you'll find. There'll be a desensitization of the people. Desent. Through the process of my eating meat. Does that make sense? Then you're in the environment side of things, you'll see not only does the animal die, which is quite obvious, right? But lots of other animals unrelated to that animal have already had to die to create the food for the animal that's just died. Right? So there's animals, let's call them more native animals that have had to die as a result of the process. Right? And then there's all these deforestation techniques that happen, you know, burning off and all these other things. And that kills multitudes of insects, lots of flowers and plants, and a lot of other animals, that, you know, right the way from insects, right the way through to lizards, snakes, and, and the hot, in fact, the entire ecosystem gets destroyed through the process of eating meat. We start, so we start to analyse all this. See, see, what we're trying to do here in this step is we're trying to develop just an intellectual awareness that actually I can see looking at these facts, 
about this situation, something's wrong. Something's, something damaging is happening through my choice to do this. Does that make sense? There's just an intellectual awareness at this point, but it's just an intellectual awareness that the damage is happening. The sin, there is a sin here. Does that make sense to everyone? That's where we're at with this particular section. Intellectual awareness that what I am doing is wrong and it needs to be changed. Awareness of why it is wrong. So in other words, now I know oh, it's wrong because everything that I, the meat that I eat harms the environment further and, and I've worked out, oh, there's also the other thing I found out in this investigation, that it takes ten times more energy to feed me with meat than it does to feed me with a veg vegetable or vegetarian diet. Right, so I find that out in my investigation and I go, well, it's, it's very, um, what you classify as uneconomical as well. There's, and then, of course, there's the desensitization of the people that are involved and then there's the animals that have to die in order for me to eat meat. Not only the animal itself, but all the native animals and all the native creatures and all of the ecosystem that has to die in order for me to eat meat. I tear down, you know, there's places tearing down millions of trees just in order for us to eat meat, right? So, so we work out all that and we start going, wow, my participation in this action that I was denying caused any problems before. Now I'm starting to realise intellectually at least, wow, I'm, I'm just causing a lot of problems here. A lot of problems for the earth, the environment, for people, for myself obviously because I'm living in the environment, so obviously for myself even. Right? Now I've become intellectually aware that there is a sin. That make sense? Yeah. Lani, thanks. So Lani and... Yeah. Sorry. Lani, um, so can we use that same process if, we're, uh, if we become... In Aware of like um, we're afraid of speaking up the truth in certain situations yep. or something like Certainly. that. Certainly. So let's let's substitute the process. So let's say we're unaware that that we we're afraid of speaking up. So let's say that's a, so it's a fear of speaking up. That's our first point. We become aware that we are afraid of speaking up. Um, so where's the sin in that? You tell me where the sin in that is. Rose, um, not being true to yourself. So you're not being truthful with yourself, right? So you're not being true. So you said it true to yourself. So let's use that term. Yeah, true to self. What else? If we go across to just back, straight back to Bruce. You're not, if it's with someone else, you're not, um, you're actually in, injuring them, you're not helping them by, by actually speaking up and saying something, you know, is wrong. How are you injuring them? Just be more specific here. Okay. But this is not about saying that they're wrong or right or anything. This is just speaking up, like, this is just even speaking up in any interaction. Well, you're not giving them the opportunity to self-reflect. Well, no, that's if you're speaking truth, but I'm just talking here about speaking up at all, about any issue. So let's say we start talking about, you know, you know, motor cars, and you don't speak up. In other words, you don't say what your opinions are, and you don't say what you feel. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking, and you're not saying anything. Yeah. What, what's happening? I'm shutting down. I'm not... Um, <laughs> what's happening... I'm just, unloving you because I'm not yeah, just a bit closer. I'm unloving with you because I'm not sharing. What aren't you sharing? Um, my experiences, or you're not sharing yourself. Myself, yeah. you're not sharing yourself. So what are you making me do? What are you forcing me into doing? Besides doing all the talking. Yeah, um, you're forcing <laughs> me to do all the engagement. Yeah. You're forcing me to do to the whole all the work. Hmm. A one sided conversation. It's a, yeah, it's a one sided conversation. You're forcing me to do all the work. So you're forcing, remember, every time we force somebody, we're I'm harming loving. their will. 
We're forcing, if they want to engage me now, I'm forcing them to be more engaged than I am. That's unethical, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So can we start seeing? So let's, uh, if we go back to Catherine, over there, yeah. Not speaking up, we're also living in our facade and we're also living in our injured self. So we're presenting a facade, yeah. So can they ever really know what I'm thinking, know what I'm feeling, really? I'm, no. no. So I'm presenting a facade, yeah. And I am being afraid, I'm afraid as well, and ignoring it. Yes, so you're in your injured self because you've probably been told to shut up or something like Possib that by your parents. Possibly, but we're probably using that as an excuse, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? So we're excusing our injured self rather than actually feeling it. Yeah. Okay. Now, can you see already, there's already a lot of good reasons why I shouldn't do that, right? Intellectually. Can you see that? So, so now I'd be starting to see, ah, oh, wow, I'm starting to see the sin involved with that. I'm starting to see, actually what I'm doing is I'm forcing other people to engage me more than I'm engaging them. I'm making them work harder for this interaction. That's not very kind to them. That's not very loving to them. I'm starting to see, wow, I'm being unloving, so therefore it is a sin because anything that's out of harmony with love is a sin. So I'm, I'm actually not being loving in this interaction with this person. I'm not being true to myself. I'm displaying a facade to them. I'm expecting them to interact with my facade rather than my real self. So I'm uh, like I'm already doing quite a lot of things now. Who have you thought that when when you don't speak up, you're actually committing a sin? Uh, not many, right? How about that? And yet, yeah. Now, once you know you are, you go, "Wow! Even if it's for the sake of every other person other than myself, I should fix this problem, shouldn't I? Because uh, I'm actually being unloving to other people while I do this." You think about it for a moment, just for yourself. Some of the most difficult people to talk to are the people who never express themselves, never really tell you what's going on with themselves and expect you to do all the work for them. Aren't they? So how does it feel on the receiving end of one of these people? It feels like, here I go again. I have to go through and do all the work for them. Huh? Can you see all we've done with eating meat is we've said investigate the damage it does. Now we're talking about an emotion and we're investigating the damage it does. From an intellectual perspective, same process, different thing. Same deconstruction process. Yeah. Uh, Linda, so if we flip that around and we're having an interaction with somebody who wants to do all the talking yes. and commands all, all of the attention, yes. the loving thing to do is still to to expose what's actually going on and let them know that, hang on a minute, I'm part of this discussion, you know, why are you holding the floor sort of thing, wouldn't it, really, rather than just it sit would there. Be, but, but if I'm angry about them doing that, yeah. would it be then? No, no, because, because I'm then already I need to feel <laughs> Can you feel see? The like, yeah, so I'll, only, I'll only be able to do that if I really love them and care about them and say, oh, this isn't, and if you're not upset about it. Because if you're really upset about it, the first thing you need to do is look at your own sin, which is being upset. Yeah. <laughs> then you need to feel your <laughs> and go through this process with your own sin first. That's what I meant in the first century when I said, first remove the rafter from your own eye before you can actually remove the straw from your brothers. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so where, yes, when you notice something going on with someone else, yes, notice it and notice that there's a sin being committed. But if you're angry, you're committing an even greater sin. They're just talking too much. You're angry. That's worse. <laughs> yeah, so if I notice what's going on 
and notice how I'm feeling about that yep. and I don't do anything about it. I allow them to continue. So in, a, in other words, you've let go of all of your angry response and all of your you know, annoyance about it and you've worked your way through all that and I suggest to you that hardly any of you have done that but let's say you have, then you would say, yeah, do you realise in this conversation you're talking a lot and you don't let me say anything? So the most loving thing to do for myself in that situation is to just excuse myself and say I need to feel what's going on here for me or something and well it depends what you're feeling like if you're doing that with me mm. I'm not feeling anything other than that you're talking a lot mm. and I just go mm -hmm. do you realize you're talking a lot Okay, so but, it could be if, just that simple. It could Do be that you, simple. Yeah. Well, it is that simple once you've released the emotion. It's yeah. that simple. You do, that's what you get from me, isn't it, most yeah. time? You're talking like now. Have you noticed that? Mm. <laughs> now, but if you're angry about it, oh, that's a very different thing, isn't it? Because mm. you're now committing an even greater sin. Mm. All right? And now you're angry, you'd be far better off saying, look, I'm really upset. Um, I need to. You wouldn't even bother telling them why, right? You'd just say, I'm really upset. I need to leave this conversation. Um, I need to go and deal with some things. And you just go off and deal with some things. Okay. And later on, if you, if you have another discussion with them, they say, why, they say, why did you walk out of the conversation for? You, you could say, well, I don't know if I've really dealt with it all yet, you know, but, but the feeling I had was that you were just talking all the time, you wouldn't let me speak, and, that's, and I started getting angry about that, and I realised that that was worse than you talking too much. And so I went off and <laughs> tried to deal with my anger about why, you, you know, why I felt that way. But that's not what most of us do, right? No. no, most of us go, you talk too much and you always do this to me and you always... And, and, and you know, there's our angry word response that's worse than them talking too much from a sin perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Good day, Pierre. Pierre, just about the same example, um, the fact of telling them, like, you, you deal with all your emotions, you are loving in a loving place, and you tell, you talk too much, but am I respecting their free will if they don't want to hear that? Well, let's say they, so, so let's say they're in an interaction with me, and I've dealt with all of my anger and anger about someone talking too much. I'm perfectly okay with it. Like, you can talk as much as you want around me. If I want to sit there and listen to it, I'll sit there and listen to it. If I don't want to sit there and listen to it, I would say, uh, I would leave. And I wouldn't feel bad either way. Right? So, so if I just let them talk and talk, and I just say, when, when, they, when they stop for a breath, I just say, do you realise you're talking a lot? Right? That would be a kind thing to say to them, if I'm in the space where I'm kind, if I'm loving. And I say, do you realise you're talking a lot? Do you, want to, do you want to discuss why that's the case? And if they, and if they get stuffed, I'm not talking to you about that. <laughs> I'll say, well, that's all right, I'm leaving too. Because I don't want to listen to you anymore. Uh, but you wouldn't leave because you're angry. You'd just leave because you didn't want to listen anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so when you start analysing all of this carefully, you can see that it's pretty obvious. What I'm saying is pretty obvious, right? But the first step, the, f the second step we're now talking about here, is this intellectual awareness of the damage that you're doing. That needs to happen. You need to become aware of the damage you're actually doing. Okay. Should we move on to the third step? Let's do that. So third step. Intellectual awareness that the unloving behaviour has a cause within ourselves. So we go, here's our third step. So we go, right. I eat meat. But it does all this damage. But I still want to eat meat. Right? Now, why? There's got to be something inside of me that ignores all of this intellectual truth that I've discovered about eating meat that causes me to still want to do it. There's got to be something inside of me, an emotion inside of me, that causes me to think that that doesn't matter. 
There's got to be some justification going on inside of me that causes me to think that it's okay to do all of this damage. And it's okay to desensitise people who slaughter my meat. And it's okay to use ten times the amount of energy that I need to on this planet. And it's okay to destroy the environment for the native animals and creatures. There's something inside of me that says that must be okay. Otherwise I wouldn't do it. Right? So what I'm becoming aware of now is that there's something inside of me, right? And I, I'm, at this stage I might not know what it is. But I could, I could write down, I could say things, things like, I am justifying eating meat. So I could say that. Couldn't I? I go, okay, I'm trying to look at why am I justifying it. Ah, oh, because I like the taste more than I care about millions of animals dying. Right? Or I'm scared because I feel that if I don't eat meat, I won't have protein. If I don't have protein, I won't survive. So I want these animals to die so I can survive. Or you know, there's got to be something going on, doesn't there? At this stage, it's still an intellectual analysis, so I don't really know what it is. But, I, but I'm starting to look at the possibilities of what it may be. Does that make sense? There's something that causes me to justify the damage internally. Just like in this situation, there's something inside of me, probably fear, right? But there's something inside of me that I'm justifying doing all of this to other people. There's got to be a reason inside of me. The cause is within me. Uh, this is this step. Intellectually seeing the cause has to be inside of you. Now, at this stage, you don't really know what the cause is. You're just becoming aware that the fact that you do this damage and you do it by choice means there has to be a reason. <laughs> so what do you think our next step might be? Oops, that's backwards. The next step is being willing to find the cause. So the previous step was being aware that there has to be a cause and that it has to be inside of ourselves. This step is being willing to find it. You know, there's a lot of difference between knowing there has to be a cause inside of you and being willing to find it. All right. A lot of us know all sorts of things about ourselves. In other words, we've done the first two or three things. We know all sorts of things about ourselves, but we're not willing to find the reason why. <laughs> why wouldn't you be willing to find the reason why? Any ideas? Even intellectually, why wouldn't you be willing to find the reason why? So, Julie? Firstly, I don't like to be wrong. Right. And being self absorbed. Yep, not caring, not wanting to care. Mm. Feeling like if I, if I have to care about this, now, now my life has to change. I don't want my life to change. So, so in other words, I'm being selfish. So that might be one of the reasons why I don't want to know, develop any willingness to fix it. Because I like being selfish, I want that thing. And I don't care what damage it's doing. And at that stage, you're not going to get further, but at that stage it would be great to just sit with that and go, wow, whew, that's pretty amazing really. Hey, I'm willing to kill hundreds of animals, I'm willing to desensitise other humans, I'm willing to use ten times the amount of energy that I need, and, and still I'm saying to myself, I don't care. And just sit with that for a while, be good, huh? Sit with that feeling for a while, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. No, the reality is I don't care. I don't care what I'm doing. That'd be a good place. That's where you're sitting. Now, the, before the next step can be engaged, you have to begin to care. <laughs> right? Because this is about willingness. We want to find, we want to say, by this stage, we're now trying to get through this feeling that we don't care, and we're trying to go, okay, and it's a thought, really. It's driven by our feelings, but it's a thought, really. I don't really care. And, and as a result, we've got to at some point go, wow, that's pretty callous, right? Given the damage. 
and come to terms even intellectually with the fact that I'm pretty callous. I don't really care. And do I want to be a callous person? What, how's my will being engaged? Do I want to remain a callous person or do I want to actually become somebody who's more sensitive? You see, you know, I would have to actually even intellectually desire that before I would make the next step after this. But let's assume though that we have done this. So let's look at uh, the, the next step. Whoops, I think I've done the wrong way around. So we have to develop a willingness. So this is some willpower, if you like, to find the emotional cause. But when I say willpower there, because it's intellectual, it's not emotional, right? But, but it does involve your will because you're not even going to want to go there unless you really feel something inside of you that you want to resolve the issue. Does that make sense? So I need to remove the word willpower there and replace it actually in the slide with just will. Have the will of the soul, a real feeling in your soul that you want to, at least intellectually, become aware. Whoops, wrong way. Wrong way. That's it. Okay. So next step. We've become willing. What do we do? We've intellectually, we're willing. What do we do? We become aware. So you go, okay, so now, so now I'm no longer justifying, because I've gone over this step now, I'm no longer justifying, I've now become aware that it is a problem and I'm willing to see it's a problem. To see the damage, to see the sin, I'm, I'm really... I can see that it's unloving and, and there's a reason within me and I start to actually f start to see intellectually at this stage, still not emotional, I'm starting to see what that reason might be. Right? So initially at this stage with eating meat I might go, ah, everybody else does it. And when I go out to dinner with everybody else, like I like to fit in with the crowd. So that's why I do it. And I know my mum and dad do it. And if I go around to mum and dad and say, look, I've become a vegan, they're going to go, oh, here we go, another one of those crap pots, right? And I don't want to feel that emotion. I don't want to feel... So this is all just intellectual analysis still. But I'm starting to see the reasons why the causes inside of me. I'm starting to sort of have a bit of a link between having the willingness and now seeing some of the reasons why I might do it. And I, it's best to, at this point, say why you may do it. Because at this stage you don't really know, do you? Because everything's emotional. But you've become aware of the actual cause, or what you think is the actual cause, is probably a better way of saying it, of the unloving behaviour. So at this point you're going, wow, I think it might be... And off you go. Oh, I think it might be that actually I'm scared that if I don't eat meat, I'll... my my muscles will waste away and you know I'll become anemic and you know there'll be all this iron deficiency in me as well and you know the doctors will tell me that I'm not very healthy now and all those things and that you know and I don't want to put up with all that crap from people so I prefer to eat meat or it could be just you like the taste and there's a reason why you like the taste of burnt flesh there's something about burnt flesh that makes you you like that or whatever it could be whatever at this stage you don't really know but you're trying to develop some awareness. Does that make sense? Rose, you have a question? Rose, can it also, becoming aware of that I don't have faith in God's provision... Or in your body. In my body. To fix itself, repair itself with a vegetarian diet? Yeah. yeah. You, there's all sorts of things here you might intellectually know. Does that make sense? You, if you're really open intellectually, you'll be able to just ask people and say, why, why wouldn't you do it? And then you can write down their reasons. <laughs> and your reason might be one of them. Do you know what I mean? Because it's an intellectual process at this stage, you don't know yet what it is, but you've got to come up with some ideas. It's like brainstorming, isn't it? 
So brainstorm. What do you think my, well, the ideas might be? Just brainstorm. Ask people. You know, what I do is I talk to people about their feelings, their, why don't they don't do different things, and I write those things down. And, you know, you, it's amazing what you get to know when you talk to different people. It's just an intellectual gathering of information which is going to help you be aware, or at least what you believe to be aware, of the actual problem. Right. So I'm now starting to demonstrate through the exercise of my will, aren't I, that I'm willing to or desiring to actually resolve this issue. I haven't resolved it yet, but I'm willing to attempt the resolution. Okay, so I've become aware of the actual cause of my unloving behaviour, or what I believe to be the actual cause. It might not be the actual cause, but it's my, my, what I believe. What's next? So I become intellectually aware of what God's truth is on the matter. Okay, so here's where you, come, you have this light bulb moment. You go, oh. So you know these light bulb moments that you guys sometimes have? Yeah? This is this stage. You go, oh. I now think I know what eating my eating meat's all about. I'm, a, I'm afraid that when, my, when I start eating a different diet, that all sorts of bad things will happen in my body and I'm actually petrified about something bad happening to my body. I'm worried about that. And, oh, so this is a big epiphany sort of a moment, intellectually. Nothing's happened emotionally, just intellectual epiphany, if you like. And, oh, God's truth is that nothing would happen to my body. If I do things in harmony with more of God's laws, it makes sense logically, doesn't it? That I would actually be more healthy, not less. So, so actually, it makes sense from a logical perspective, if I really believed in God and I really accepted God's truth, that I wouldn't have to destroy all of these things just in order for me to survive. So I start realising, ah, oh, God's created me in such a way that I can actually survive and can build muscle and maintain muscle even though I'm eating a vegetarian diet. So I'm now aware, intellectually aware, of what God's truth is. I'm starting, and again, this is a bit of a guess sometimes, isn't it? Because at this stage we still don't know. But it's a place that we've gotten to, and a place where we believe what God's truth would be from an intellectual perspective at least. Does that sound all right? So next. This is quite challenging for me because I eat meat. Yep. And uh, funnily enough, I used to be a vegan. Yep. Yep. And, and why um, did you stop? I stopped actually after the pageant messages yeah. and connecting with how I felt. Yeah. But why I, did you stop? Because I felt that when I got into it, it was more an, an intellectual thing. So it was an intellectual choice or decision? Choice that, that I was But there must be something that motivated you to go back. Yes. What, what was it? Well, I, I felt that... I wanted to be real, yeah. and I felt that God had made me in a way that I, that I was, you know, a creation that ate animals. Like there are animals that eat other animals, and then there are animals that are vegetarian. And I thought that I was a creation that ate other, other animals. animals. Right. So there was sort of like, like a justification of. Well, it's just that I felt that's how I wa that's how God made me. Yeah. To that that I, I'm made. Can I can I suggest all that's intellectual? There was some emotion that drove you. And it's, to be honest, it's just you wanted to eat meat, really, but but you gave it up for other reasons. I like meat. I like yes. the smell of meat. Yes. And I like the taste of meat. Even when yeah. I was a vegan, I did. Yeah. Now we're starting to get onto the real yeah. issues, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, because that was an intellectual thing. Yeah. But really, in my heart, I still liked yeah. the taste of meat. And so now we're being honest, right? Yeah. So this is yeah. getting out of the facade. Remember, yeah. the facade's saying, 
I'm not eating meat, you know, yeah. I'm going to not eat meat, I'm, you know, I'm ve vegan now, That's isn't right. it wonderful? Yeah, yeah. And the feeling yeah. inside of and, you is... And, and, you know, all of you are destroying the planet and, you know, all you guys that, that you know, do eat meat. Yeah. yeah. That's when I... All the attack of yeah, other people yeah, and all that happens, yeah. of and course, in that place. And feeling justified and righteous and, yeah. and you know... Yeah. yeah, but the real feeling inside was, I really would like to have yeah. some meat, thanks. I love the smell of meat on the barbecues, you know, yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so... Can you see that that the feeling was always th that way? Yeah. Yeah. And so, of course, there's going to be a justification at some point yeah. to go back to it. That's right. And this is... Well, and, in, and it was that I wanted to be real. I wanted to, you know, honour how no, I that's felt. a justification because it's not being real. Well, sorry. It's being... It's, it's choosing a logical argument that supports your already made internal decision. And this is where this is where our mind gets way out yeah, of harmony. Right? That's really, um, yeah. Like I observe many in the audience doing this all the time. You choose a logical argument yeah. that supports your already determined decision. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the 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 decision of the soul has already been made. Yeah. You're just looking for a logical argument that supports it. Yeah. That's true. That's right. Yes. Does that make sense? <laughs> because you can't yes. do it if it's illogical. Yeah. So I was I was fooling myself basically. Well, what in that place? What everybody does is they ignore logical arguments that don't support the decision, right. yeah. which are all these. Yeah. And then they only write logical arguments that do support the decision. Does that make sense? Mm. And then they say, "Oh, there's my logical arguments for supporting the decision. Off I go." But the decision has already been made. Yeah. It's already been made in the soul. It's already happened. Is it, do you see the difference? And, and this is where we've got to be careful, right? A lot of us are not honouring the fact that actually I've already made the decision. You remember yesterday, I was, or the day before yesterday, I was talking to Sandra and Pierre, and Sandra admitted she's already made the decision that she wants somebody, a man, to, uh, you know, to harm. It sounds pretty harsh, but she's already made that decision. Does that make sense? And that's a good thing to acknowledge. That the decision's already been made. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's being honest with yourself. It is being honest with yourself. Yeah. That's that's an improvement over being dishonest with yourself. So actually, when you met, went to eating back eat, to eating meat, you were still being dishonest with yourself, because you were st you were trying to say that the reason for making that choice was some other reason than the fact that you'd already made it. <laughs> Does that make sense? And you'd already wanted it, and you already wanted it all the time, you were actually doing the opposite. You still wanted that thing. Yes. It's about like it's, like, it's like me saying, like, um, it's like me projecting sexually at another woman because I want her, I want her, I want her, and then trying to not do it. Like, I, I, the decision in my soul has already been made. And we've got to get to a point where we realize that. That, ah, this is, see, this is where I can use my intellect very deviously, even for myself. <laughs> because what I can do is I can go, okay, if, if I ignore all of one side of the argument and I only take in the side of the argument that supports my already made choice, decision, mm -hmm. yeah. then that's pretty devious, even for myself. <laughs> do you see? A person who does this intellectual process will not ignore one side of the argument. They won't ignore the fact. They won't ignore facts, and they have to be facts. But they won't ignore facts just because their desire is to ignore them, because they've already made a choice. Yeah. So a more honest thing to do would be to say, when you made the decision to eat meat, I like it. I want to do it. I've always liked it. Even when I was vegan, I always liked it. And to be honest, I was a bit of a hypocrite telling everybody else <laughs> that yeah. they shouldn't, you know, they're destroying the country or, or, the, or the planet by doing it because I really like it myself. And just admit that. That's, a, that's the most honest place you could have been. Does that make sense? But when you tell yourself this other story, you're still being dishonest and therefore still maintaining the facade about it. And this is all about deconstructing the facade. Does that make sense?
So, so the key for you at the moment, if you're eating meat, and by the way, I chose that subject because it's a simple subject that I think uh, Julie brought up. Um, but, like, so it's not a personal attack on yourself, Max, but, but rather just to show what the process is in terms of what we go through. So it's a great illustration of the process we go through. You're far better off saying, I'm eating meat and I like it and I don't care about the damage what it does. That, that, is, that is not denial anymore. That is the next step. Your awareness, you're now aware of the sin. You just don't think the sin's important enough to do anything about it. So can I just see if I've got it right? Yep. So when I justified it to myself the second time, I, yep. I based it on a lie to start with. Correct. So, you know, the, you know I'm starting from, from a lie anyway. So you're starting from complete denial of what the real reason yeah, is. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And you need to acknowledge the real reason. I just like it. There's my real reason. Yeah, I like meat. I like meat, yeah. yeah. And the average person on the planet probably would say the same thing. And, and by the way, there's a whole reason why they like it, because most, most uh, vegan meals are made so terribly bad that I can understand why most people want to eat meat as a substitute. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the food here has been delicious. Exactly. I, I, was, I was very surprised. When I was coming here, I was dreading having to eat vegan because my memories of vegan is bland, tasteless. Correct. Uh, being hungry 10 All minutes after I've eaten. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and two meals a day, I'm full, I'm fine, you know. I'm, yeah. I don't even need a snack, you know, yeah. in between. Yeah, because... And the, eating meat, uh, I, I'm hungry more. Because the meals that we've been doing are balanced. They meet all of the physiological requirements of your body. There's all sorts of reasons why that is the case. And they're tasty. <laughs> like, when, when somebody feeds me you know, a heap of vegetables, they say, you're vegan, and they go, and they roll up their nose or eyes, and they go, and they try to do both at the same time. I don't know how they manage that, but... <laughs> and then... And then what they do is, you know, they go, okay, no worries. And then they put this plate on me and I'm eating it and going, surely they don't think that I eat like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, it's terrible. <laughs> and, and then, they, then they, they get, they're probably thinking the same thing, you know, like, surely he doesn't eat like this, it's terrible. Uh, what's wrong with him? Some, some self, you know, some self-sacrificing masochist going on there. And the reality is with the meals we have are like, 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 so tasty, it's just amazing. But this is one of the reasons why most people are attracted to eating meat because the taste of burnt flesh is better than the taste of nothing at all. <laughs> I've, I've just banned nothing at all, right? <laughs> you know, I agree with that, I do. Right? But the reality is the taste of really well done spiced food is much better than meat. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't use a lot of spices when I when I. Was yeah, well, vegan. most people when they go vegan, they go for the reason of, you know, trying to improve the planet, and they they don't have any imagination. They've never been taught how to cook or any of those things. You see, this is a part of the education process in the in this intellectual phase. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You want to pass? Thank on? you. Right back to Nick. Um, I went through, sorry Nick, I went through a similar process to Max. I yeah. adopted a, a raw vegan diet um, about six, seven years ago, yeah. uh, coming from an uh, omnivorous diet for most yeah. of my life. Yeah. I'm heavily addicted to all sorts of foods. Yeah. Uh, but I went through an intellectual process. Uh, yeah. very and your body's wasting away as a result. Yeah, because I went to an absolute extreme version, like, going through this what is loving, what is not, and I got down to pure fruitarianism where, and not only within the aspect of diet, but I got to the point where I didn't want to use paper, I didn't want to use fuel, I yeah. didn't want to use uh, a dwelling. Yeah. Uh, I, I took myself off to Africa, I lived yeah. under a tree, yeah. with no running water, no electricity, yeah. just extreme, you know, to the point of almost self-annihilation. Yep. Which um, is actually the pattern of why what's happening to your body now, isn't it? This, mm -hmm. this is the absorption of all the annihilating spirits around you, also engaging in the same treatment of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one of the um, problems with that is that I, I, I sort of adopted this perspective that God's truth is that God designed us, made us, not as an omnivore, but as a a raw vegan to eat fresh fruits, leafy yep. green veggies, small amounts of nuts and seeds. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the compromise. Well, that, the reality is God designed us to eat nothing at all. But yeah, and that's the other thing. <laughs> I, I also, 
I, I came to accept that as well. Yeah, so in, that, intellectually. Yeah. So okay. So that means all of you should start eating nothing at all. See how long you last on that diet. Yeah. <laughs> right. See, this is when once you get to you, you start realizing after you start dealing with a lot of emotions that you need less and less food, right? And eventually, you start using less and less food automatically. But only if you change, you do the, the second half of this process. Yeah. See, if you do all of these decisions with this first half of the process and you reach this intellectual awareness that God's truth is, in this case, God's truth, the intellectual awareness you came to was God's truth means that I need to be a fruitarian. Or is that what you call a person who eats fruit and nuts? Yep. No, yep. just fruit, fruitarian. Just fruit. Yep. yep. So, um, well, let's say fruit and nuts. Let's say that was, the, that was the decision you arrived at, right? And then you stop there and you go, okay, God's, that's God's truth. So there's so you know there's no spices, no taste, just fruit and nuts. Well, they fruit pretty good. Like that's our favourite meal of the day. Um, is my breakfast when I have some fruit. So we decide that, right? But it's just an intellectual decision still. Uh, and while it might be closer to the truth, we still don't really know what God's truth is. Mm. At this stage, we're closer to it because we've gone through a process that's analysed the damage, right? But because we haven't done any soul work, we are, if we only act upon this decision without doing further work, we will damage ourselves. Yeah, that's yeah. what I found very much so. Because yeah. within me was huge amounts of desires to eat spiced food. Like yeah. Not so much meat, but yeah. you know, nice cooked vegan meals and yeah. Yeah. that sort of thing. But absolute denial of, of even the possibility of that and forcing myself. Yep. To eat a certain way. Yep. yep. Mm. That's exactly right. Good eye. Yep. So so we're we're now can we say we're halfway through the process? Probably not, right? Because because at this stage we have only done the intellectual work. Right? So at this stage we've come to some kind of awareness, but we've asked ourselves what God's truth would be. We try to work out we don't really know God's truth but rather we think we know what it would be at this point. Right? So if we looked at this fear of speaking up, we think we know, oh, well, I think God's truth is that if I was really connected with my soul, I'd be as expressive as the next guy. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't have this fear of speaking up. I'd speak up when I feel like it, and I wouldn't, but I, when I don't, but I wouldn't have a fr be afraid of speaking up. And I start, I've realised at this point that actually, because I'm afraid of speaking up, I treat people pretty badly, actually. I get them to do all the work in all my relationships. That's not very nice, you know. Some of them might not want to do that work. And there they are. Having, if I'm trying to engage them, they're doing all this work. Well, it's not very really kind to them. So, so can you see by this stage I'm seeing the intellectual awareness of God's truth would be, oh, my fear of speaking up is a sin. And a fear of speaking up is driven by this, you know, there's obviously some feelings in me that I'm trying to avoid. And, and I, I've started to try to work out what they are. And I come to the point, conclusion that, yes, actually this feeling that's inside of me that I'm trying to avoid well, I'm assuming that it's there, um, is actually a problem from God's perspective. Does that make sense? Elvira? How am I going time waste, babe? I'm getting a bit behind, aren't I? Um, last night I was angry at you. Yep, which you are quite frequently, if you admit to yourself. Yep. Yeah. Spent all morning hyperventilating that you were going to ask me to not come back. Um, but then when I sat down and I thought, all right, why are you really angry? And I went through a bit of a process. Yeah. Is that why you haven't... Kicked you out. Yeah. yeah. Because, it, because you're starting to do this process of, of at least even intellectually being aware that me... Like, it's not, it's not me that makes you angry. There's something going on inside yeah. of you, right? So, so you're starting to become aware of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's improvement. Oh. I like anything improving. Mary? Uh, just when you're done with Elvira, sorry. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I'm done. I was just going to ask Elvira, would you mind moving your seat just one metre to your left? Because there's our, an ongoing issue with, with getting you on camera. Getting you on camera. 
you're hiding That's from the camera. That's You're hiding from the camera. Every time you ask a question, we can't get you. Thank you. Okay. So you make three people work when you hide from the camera. Poor Igor, he's out the back, he's trying to get a shot he can't get. And poor Corny, he's on the side there, trying to get a shot he can't get. And he's moving around, trying to go around it. And I'm talking to someone who I haven't got a face to talk back on on the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've come to this conclusion, which is really good, right? We're intellectually aware of God's truth, or we think we are. It's a really, really good place to be compared to where we were, right? We, we were in total denial before. This is an improvement. But, but it's still an unloving condition. It's an improvement. I've grown in love, but it's still an unloving condition. Yep. Okay, so what do we do to do the next series of things? Well, this is where I've just got to talk to you about this soul versus intellectual awareness. Because we see this happening all the time, you know, like where people, you know, believe they've had some kind of soul based epiphany and yet their behavior doesn't change at all. And the reality is they are still really engaged in the same feelings. And, and this means that no real improvement has occurred. So, how do we translate an intellectual process into having real improvement? we've got to engage a soul-based process that's very similar in its nature with some additional steps. Okay. So even though I've made intellect have some intellectual awareness, I have to become aware at this point that I've made no soul-based change aside from one perhaps, and that is I'm now using my will, which is a great thing, in order to become more loving. Whereas before, I didn't even want to do that. So that's a good improvement. But aside from that, I've not made any improvement on the issue itself. Aside from actually having some intellectual awareness that it exists, that there's a problem with it, and that, you know, but these are all intellectual things. They're not, there's no real change in my life at this stage. By the way, at this stage, I might have stopped eating meat. I might have looked at all the damage and said to myself, wow. That damage is too much for me to, to deal with emotionally. I don't want to deal with that damage anymore. I want to stop. Right? So I might have stopped eating meat at this point, Even, just as a willpower, an intellectual-based decision. You know? Even though I desperately want some meat, feeling inside of me is that I want some meat. Right? So at this stage, the feeling inside of me is that I still would like to eat meat, but I might have stopped. So, right? But the feeling is still the same. Does that make sense? So like before, when we talked about the other issue of being afraid to speak up, the feeling inside of me is I'm still afraid to speak up. <laughs> Nothing's really changed on that front. I've just now realised that there's a lot of things wrong with that and that, the, that, I, that there's a cause within me and what the cause probably is. I've realised what that is and what God's truth is about it. But I still haven't actually made a change yet because change require, is required at the soul level to make a change. Does everyone get that? Now, can I just pause for a second? Is everyone okay? Yep. Am I bamboozling you with a lot of technicalities here? No? So everyone's good? That's good. Let's continue. Okay. This is very key part too that I must say. I have removed my intellectual barriers to a soul-based emotional change. You see, the problem with most of us is that we don't engage soul-based change because we have a lot of intellectual barriers that have been established in order to prevent the soul-based change from occurring. And that's when we do things like we were talking to Max about before. You know, coming up with justifications for unloving behaviour because we've already made a choice to do the unloving thing and now we need something to tell us that it's okay that we made that choice. Right? So once we've removed that thing that causes the intellectual barrier, we're now saying, I want to eat meat and I realise that it's wrong and I realise that from God's perspective it's this and that and this and that, but I still want to eat meat. And I know it's bad, but I know it's not good because I can see that it does all this damage and sometimes I feel a bit guilty about that. But I still want to eat meat because, it, because it still, I still feel like I want to. You see? 
like the other person before, I still feel like I don't want to speak up when I'm around people. I just don't want to do it. Like, but I know that it's not good, and I know that it's this, and I know that's that. But it, I still want to. I still want to do what. I still want to be quiet. I still want to make other people do all the work. But I know that's not right from an intellectual perspective to keep doing that. That's the place we're at, right? Everyone okay with that? We're real clear. That's where we're at at this point. All right. We're being honest now, though, aren't we? We're being honest that I really want to. Feelings there, I really want to do it. I'm also being honest that God's truth is probably saying I probably shouldn't. You know, I'm being honest about God's truth now. So this is a good place. You know, I'm at least intellectually being honest about the whole thing. Yeah. So when someone says, oh, are you still at meat? You go, I go, yeah. And they go, don't you feel bad about that? Yeah. So why do you do it? Because I really want to. I like the taste and, you know, I haven't, it, it hasn't, I don't want to change. I'm honest about it. I don't come up with a hundred reasons why. You know, like God, oh, because I worked out God created the right teeth, the insides of teeth, and that's for ripping apart meat, and this is the reason why I do it. You know, I don't go down that track. I just, I'm honest about where I'm at. This is, by the way, a really lovely place to get people, right? Like, uh, like some of you in, in different discussions have been at this place, and I go, wow, that's really good. I, I like that place that you're in. It's not, you know, still hasn't changed anything, but at least you're aware of what's going on. It's a really good thing. Okay. So now we start the emotional process. Now I become emotionally aware that this thing exists and is real. So, in other words, I'm eating meat. So, let's use that as the example still. And now, when I become emotionally aware, you remember the damage that I listed before. You remember that damage that I listed before? All that damage that was done, you know, to the environment, to myself, to my body, to, you know, all, those, all that damage. Now, I'm becoming aware that that is wrong from an emotional perspective. In other words, by the, at this stage, I start having a good cry about what I've done. Wow, like, man, I've just ruined environments like by this desire. So I start letting myself feel that. I start feel how desensitized. Like after I went in to, to, to see the guys who were cutting off the heads of the cows and cutting them all up, and I started interacting with these guys, I found them to be so detuned from themselves. And I went home and just had a big cry. Oh, my God, like, they are just so detuned. Like, how would, I, how would I work in that environment myself? Like, how would I do that? I, I, the, the majority of you know that you wouldn't cope with it. And that's why you don't go and have a look, what it's like, right? I mean, once you go there and have a look, and, and you come out of there and you go, oh, big cry, you know, usually big amounts of emotion start coming up under those circumstances now. So... What I'm doing is I'm feeling that what I'm, I'm doing is wrong. And it needs to be changed. It's a soul-based feeling that it's wrong. So I'm now no longer needing to be intellectually convinced that it's wrong. I now know in my feelings that it's wrong. I now know the feeling of the sin. It's a soul-based feeling of what I believe God's truth to be on the matter. I'm realising now that actually God's truth is dead right and I have been wrong all this time. And you start to feel how wrong you've been. Does everyone get that? Okay. What comes next? I now need to become aware that the reason emotion there is an emotional thing going on inside of me that causes me that has caused me to engage in this sin that i am now completely aware of from an emotional perspective all right in other words i believe with all my heart at this stage i believe with all my heart that there, there is a cause emotional that's emotional within myself 
for my behavior. It has to be because otherwise I wouldn't have been motivated to do all this stuff. I wouldn't have been motivated to do all this damage. So there has to be emotional an emotional reason within me. Does that make sense? Yeah. So at this stage, that's what I'm starting to realize. So soul-based feeling that an emotion within myself causes me to take the sinful action and that the action, by this stage, I'm already feeling the action is sinful and I feel it with all my heart. And at this stage, I have a soul-based feeling that the emotion, there is an emotion in me that causes me to do it. I'm completely convinced of that. It's got nothing to do with you, nothing to do with my partner, my friends, my family, my upbringing, my whatever. I just know that the emotion is in me. That's what's driving me. Margo? Is it at that stage that your facade goes and you start feeling the pain or it's still there? Not necessarily. No. This is at least, though, the place where you start knowing that there's something inside of yourself emotionally that you've got to get to. It's important, very important you get to it. Because if you don't get to it, you know that it's going to keep happening. You know that sin, even though you've felt all how bad of it, it is, you know it's going to keep happening while this soul-based cause... And you don't know the soul-based cause yet. You just know that there has to be a cause that's so big inside of you that you're ready and willing to create the sin. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So, and it exists within me. That's a, you know, we're often going, oh, it's your fault, that's your fault, that's your fault. No, it exists within me, this thing. So, what's next? So, I know that there has to be a cause, but I don't know what it is. So, what do you think would be next? I need to do something in between this. I need to be willing to see the cause, to identify it, to feel it. See, at this stage, I might realize, hey, I'm not really willing to emotionally to find out what it is. I don't really want to go there. I want, you know, the feeling I might have inside of me at this point is, oh, I just want to ignore it. And so you'd have to, so during this phase, find out all the reasons why you're unwilling. So you'd have an emotional desire that would develop within you at this point to find all the reasons why you're unwilling and once you release those reasons why you're unwilling emotionally you will be willing right. so one of the reasons why I might be unwilling is because I like the taste of meat and I just uh, just love that taste I just love that taste that's one of the, the only reason why I'm unwilling might be the only reason why but, but usually it's much more involved than that there's lots of reasons why we're unwilling you know, one of them might be I have no faith in God at all. I don't have any faith that if I eat me, that if I eat a vegan diet, that I let, my body will actually be able to look after itself. Even I have no faith in God's laws, no faith in God at all, no faith in my body at all, and I start to feel some of that, feel that emotionally. I realise that <clears throat> that I use meat to stuff down emotion. <coughs> By this stage, I might find that out, and I go start going. Wow, I'm completely unwilling to see what emotion I'm stuffing down when I eat meat. It's like completely unwilling to see what emotion you stuff down when you have sugar. You might have the same issue with sugar. What emotions you use to suppress, you know? And you might be completely unwilling to see what they are at this stage. And you've got to work through the process to become willing. Go through all the reasons why you're not willing. And it's going to be an identification process of the emotion. So we develop soul-based emotional willingness. Remember this is the muscle, the will, the will muscle that Mary taught you about. We're developing the emotional willingness to find the emotional cause. And notice I haven't said I develop a willingness to find the cause because both willingness and cause are emotional. So we need to develop the emotional willingness to find the emotional cause. And you're not going to find the emotional cause unless you have an emotional willingness. Right. For many of you, there's no emotional willingness to find the emotional cause. There's only an intellectual willingness to find an intellectual cause. And quite often your intellectual cause is completely off because it's intellectual. It's not what's going on in your soul. 
So sometimes when you do the intellectual process, you think you've found the answer and then you start the emotional process and you realise that the answer was nothing that you thought. But at least you've gotten rid of all the baggage to prevent you going there in the process, which is a very important part. Okay, so what's next? I now have an emotion, I want to develop an emotional awareness of the cause. So before I went from seeing there was a cause emotionally, there had to be one, then I went through a process of becoming willing to see what the cause was, and now I'm starting to see the actual cause. I'm feeling the actual cause. So remember this is a soul awareness, so it's a feeling process. I'm now starting to feel, or at least be aware of the, of the cause from a feeling perspective. So in other words, this is where I start identifying the driving emotion. So I'm, si I'm sitting there and I'm feeling the driving emotion. I'm not yet fully experiencing it, I'm not releasing it. I'm just feeling the driving force, the things that drives me to that behaviour. And I'm becoming aware, wow, that is the thing that drives me to this behaviour. That is the thing that makes me do it. Like in the case of a person who, in the before we were talked about, who wasn't speaking up in situations, you know, just being quiet all the time, by this stage they're probably recognizing the actual fear and they could feel it sort of start to rise up in themselves, the actual fear they feel whenever they start to speak in a public setting. They feel the actual fear rising. That's it there. Now, can you see with some of these things, you go right the way through to this process very rapidly. But if you're really resistive, it might take you weeks or even months to go through the intellectual phase, let alone the emotional phase. It just depends on the willingness. Right? So I become emotionally aware of the actual emotional cause of my unloving behaviour because I can now feel it. I haven't experienced it fully, I'm just feeling the tips of it, you know? Do you understand what I mean by that? You go, well, there it is again. Whoa. I don't like that feeling, you know, that's the one I'm trying to get away from. But you're aware now and you can feel the sensation of it, the feeling of it, the emotion of it. You can feel it at this stage. At this point we often find that our intellectual concept of the cause was completely incorrect. Like I've gone through this process of intellectually identifying pretty much everything I've had to identify first. and Sometimes I'm right, but I'm also finding that quite a lot of times I'm wrong by the time I get to this point. Once I start actually feeling the tip of the emotion, then I, then I have a whole epiphany, another intellectual epiphany. I was completely wrong with that intellectual process, and now I can feel this is definitely right. This is, does that make sense? You get to that place. What happens next? You then need to develop a willingness to experience the cause, the, to experience the pain from the expiration of the error, to experience the cause. You see, everything that motivates a, a sinful behaviour has within us an error-based cause which is going to be painful to release. I've got to get to the point where I'm willing to go through that pain. And if I'm not willing to go through that pain, I'll get stuck here for months or years. Right? So, so it's one thing to actually feel. Now, for many of you, this happens within split seconds. Like Sometimes you ask me an intellectual question because you're intellectually aware, you want to find something, and I start speaking to you, and bang, 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 you're into some three, four awarenesses emotionally, really rapidly, and then you get to this point, and usually this is where you stop. You start to feel the tip of the iceberg, which was the previous step, right, emotionally. It, you, you tears start going, you know, even in the audience, your tears start flowing down your face. You're starting to connect to what it feels like. And then what happens? Your emotional unwillingness to experience it kicks in. So you have a little dribble and you get yourself out of it. Now you need to develop an emotional willingness to get into it somehow. Does that make sense? That's going to take a bit more effort, isn't it now? 
So you've had a little dribble, you've recognized the feeling, the feeling's now there, you're emotionally aware of the feeling, but there's still something blocking you from actually allowing the feeling to be processed. Fully, fully experienced. Nick? Um, just with that process of uh, the emotion starts to well up and you start to feel it and you start to cry, then that unwillingness kicks in. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, recommend a strategy to uh, get that willingness? Because I, I find um, my, w my will is developing in that regard. Yeah. And I'm getting more deeper and deeper and deeper into emotions and allowing it to flow. Mm -hmm. um, you know what you'll find here? that almost every reason that you don't go to the next step will have something to do with Cornelius's talk to you on day one. Do you remember what he mentioned on day one? The first one was lack of faith in himself or God. Mm -hmm. second one was a, 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 an inability to allow yourself to be emotionally overwhelmed. And the third one was resistance to emotional truth you'll find it will be one of those three things that's stopping you in your willingness here. Mm. You're unwilling to feel one of those emotions. So there are some emotions that are sort of global in their nature. And what I mean by that is they control how you deal with other emotions. Does that make sense to everyone? There are some emotions that through this process you'll identify as being global. They will affect every process you ever go through. My suggestion is once you identify one of those emotions, you need to restart the process of deconstruction with that emotion. Because if you can do that, you'll get rid of a global impediment to every emotional process. And to be honest with you, if you can get rid of all of them, then every single flow, this will be all come like an automatic process to you after that. Does that make sense? Nick, you seem a bit uncertain there. You want some intellectual rules. This is an emotional process. How can I give you intellectual rules? I can't. This is a place, a feeling that you're unwilling, that you're now facing, a feeling you're unwilling. You need to feel the feeling that you're unwilling and feel what is its cause. You need to now go through the de deconstruction process of the unwilling feeling. Does that make sense? Willing to feel feeling. And be willing to feel it in the end, yes. Otherwise it will always remain. And if it always remains, it will colour every emotional process. It will affect everything you do. Yeah. Now rather than answering too many more questions, because there's still a couple more steps, and I'm getting behind, way behind time now. So let's look at this. We develop a soul-based willingness to actually experience the emotional pain that is the cause then we actually experience the emotion. <sighs> There's the release of the emotion. Full release of the emotion will occur here. Right? If it's not fully released, there has to be some more unwillingness. So you have to go back to the previous step and work through your unwillingness. Because when you're really willing, you'll release the whole thing. Right? And it might come out of you in a few hours or a day, a few days maybe. For most of you, it will be no longer than a few days once you reach, reach this point. Right? It'll be intense. You'll feel like you're really stretched going through it. It'll be an intense process. You'll feel quite strange going through it. You might even feel very childlike as you're going through it. You might feel two years of age, three years of age, experience some of this hurt. But when you release, you're going to feel magical for a couple of days. Until you get on to the next thing, right? Yeah. So here we actually experience and feel and release the emotion that causes the error. That's what we do. Does that make sense? We release. We actually go through the release. Now once we've gone through the release, we now have a soul-based understanding of God's truth. Now that might not necessarily be automatic because we may need to accept it 
because we may have blockages to accepting what God's truth is on the matter and then we need to go through the process of deconstructing the reason why we don't want to accept God's truth on the matter, right? From an emotional perspective. But when we get to this point, we know for certain, we know for certain, no one in the future will be able to shake you, They'll be, nobody will be able to shift you. Jesus will come along and say, no, you're not right, and you say, yeah, go away. Right? Because you'll have gone through a process that is really been solidified within your soul. Now we have written on our soul a complete awareness of the truth and the cause will no longer exist within us. That's it. From that moment, everything you do on that subject will be automatic. Everything. You won't have to try. It'll just be seamless, automatic. You'll just do it automatically, no trouble at all. So let's say we had the previous example where we couldn't speak up in public. Once we get that stage and we've dealt with all of that, speak up in public, private, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, television, whatever, doesn't matter, we'll do it and we won't even have nervousness about it. We won't even be nervous. We'll just do it. Right? That's a fantastic place to be on anything. Even if it's on one thing, it's a fantastic thing to be, place to be. Right. Linda? Thanks, Dennis. Oh, Linda, so going back to the meat eating issue, does that mean that when we have fully worked all the way through the yes. injuries and errors that we have around eating meat, that we would never be able to harm any of God's environment or creatures in any way, like insects, spiders? Um, when you say harm them in any way, insects have been created for certain purposes. Yeah. We would understand their purpose. Okay. So we, we, we wouldn't be concerned about saving every insect yeah. that we meet yeah. because it, we would understand the purpose for which these things have been created, right? Okay. So, so we're not going to go to some kind of extreme thing where we're walking along like some Buddhists do with a, with a broom in front of them, sweeping away the insects so they don't tread on them, would we? Because we understand the role that these things all play in our life. But we also wouldn't go along and get out DDT and spray it wholesale over the countryside and say it's all okay. Because we'd understand the role that the insects play in our life. So but that, uh, is that all connected with this issue of eating meat and being unloving to God's creatures? Well, it, it, you may arrive at that conclusion, yes, because you would have had to have processed quite a lot of emotion about the environment in this process. So you may arrive at the conclusion. You, so those of you who talk to me privately about the environment, like, you know, you, you know my fascination with insects, right? And how the role they play. But that doesn't stop me from running through the countryside and then going, oops, I shouldn't run, I should get out of the room and see what, in, what ants I just trod on. Does that make sense? I understand their role. I'm supporting their role by building ecosystems that allow for the development of their role. So in other words, I feed my ants of my property. We, don't, we have whole great big holes that feed them. Like I'm talking like holes bigger than this auditorium you're sitting in, full of gear that feed, that's primary purpose is to feed the ants. Right? So no ants come inside anymore. <laughs> there's too much food outside now. You know, like they don't bother coming inside. There's not enough food. They are, they are engaged in this process. And the reason why I do that is because I realise the importance they play in my life. Right? So I create far more insects than I destroy in my life now. Does it make sense? Yeah? But I don't go along sweeping along in front of myself because right? I know the role that God plays those particular things in. I know God doesn't expect me to do that, to walk along sweeping in front of myself. Yeah? That's why God created billions and billions and billions and billions of different types of insects to be billions of them. So that one or two of them die and it doesn't matter. But I wouldn't then have a callous view and go, okay, if one or two of them die, it doesn't matter, so I'm going to kill a few billion of them. Right? On purpose, I wouldn't do that either because I now know the role. I know God's truth from an emotional perspective on the matter. Does that make sense? Yeah. So at this stage, I'm not afraid of cutting down a tree. 
Do you understand? I understand the role of the tree. I understand what I need to do. What, why, if, if there's something I want to change in my environment, I might find that cutting down a tree is a necessary part of improving my environment. By putting other things in its place, there might be a dominance of a certain type of tree and I know that that's because soul condition has affected the dominance and I want to change the dominance into being more variety and that's going to improve the environment. So I might actually make a decision to cut down the tree under those circumstances. Or if there was a tree over the fence of my neighbour and I know that if it fell and broke that it would break his whole house and probably kill a few people, then I'd be totally willing to cut down that tree under those circumstances because I know it's going to damage some people. I'd have to question why we built the house there in the first place but that's another question. Huh? But you, you're not afraid of making choices that are loving anymore. You're not afraid of balancing everything out and working it all through. Huh? So you're not going to be some like person who just goes, oh, you know, I, I can't hurt any insect, I can't hurt any, I can't do this, I can't. You know what you want to do and you know how to do it and you know how to do it in harmony with love. You know wholesale destruction is the worst possible thing you can engage. So you never engage it. Because you, you know. But by this stage you've got to that point. Yeah? See, you have a soul-based perception of God's truth on the matter not what other people think God's truth is and not what you would have thought God's truth is, but rather what is God's truth on the matter. Yeah. And I know God's truth on the matter of insects. Yeah. Many of you don't. That's why you try and save every one of them. You know, you get a spider in your house and you try and save him and take him outside. Right. My question is, why is he inside in the first place? There's not enough food for him outside. Well, what have you done about that? Taking him outside just puts him in a place where there's no food. He's got all the insects inside, you know, where the lights are and everything. Why are you doing that? Like what you think is a loving act sometimes is one of the most unloving things you could do. <laughs> right? You could do other things that are much more loving, right? But you would know what to do under those circumstances because you've got God's truth on the matter. You'd know your interaction with the environment and how you and your life affects the environment. You would know what to do in every situation. You would know what's extreme, you know, what, what actions you're taking just to salve your own conscience or to salve your own you know, guilt, things like that. You wouldn't do those actions anymore because all those feelings are gone too. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Wonderful place, this. You, you feel closer to God when you're in this place because you are closer to God in this place. <laughs> you're closer to God's assessment of the truth of every situation. So you just, just do this with one situation, you can feel the closeness. And if you have a longing for God through this process, you will actually feel a connection with God and God's approval of your, of your now soul-based awareness and knowledge. You'll feel that at this stage. You won't feel it before then. At this stage, you will never get angry with other people for what they do because you've gotten rid of all that. You'll never have sins of omission on the same subject because you've gotten rid of all that. And you'll never have sins of commission on the same subject because you've gotten rid of all that. And your behaviour is automatic. It's a fantastic place. Well worth the process. Yeah. Okay. So what have we said? Let's have a look, just, just generally. We've gone through a soul-based change. So the intellectual process was place of denial, awareness intellectually that it's sin exists, awareness that the unloving behaviour has a cause, awareness that, or oh, the willingness or will to develop, the co to identify the cause, and awareness of the cause within ourselves. Awareness in mind of God's truth is now there. But that is not what, a, what we need to do. That's only a little bit. Then we go to the soul process. Soul awareness that the sin exists in real. That's when we're really feeling it now, that it's real. Soul awareness, the sin has a cause within ourselves. We can feel that it has to have a cause within ourselves. We just don't know what it is. We then feel, ah, the willingness to actually find the cause, the willingness to actually feel the cause, just to, 
just a pinch of it, you know, just a little bit of it, so that we're aware from an emotional perspective of what that cause is. And then we feel the awareness of the cause. Ah, that's the feeling I can feel. I can feel what it is, not intellectually, but from my heart, I can feel what it is inside of me that's causing me to take this action. And I can feel the emotion just starting to stir up now. That emotion, I've been in denial all this time. And then I have to have the will to feel it fully. Develop the will to feel it fully. I've developed that will, I release. Boom. And once I've released, God's truth. There it is. Clear as a bell. In my soul, motivating every action from then on, I don't have to try to do anything. It's so wonderful. Yes! <laughs> if you can do that with just one thing, you will start to want to do it with a lot of things. Right. Now, once that process, so obviously you're going to have to do that process a number of times emotionally before that process is like written on your soul. Once that process is written on your soul, you will automatically engage it without having to look at a book and go, well, what's the next step? Does that make sense? You will just automatically engage that process. You know where you... You will know... The beauty of this is you will know where you are at any point in time on the issue. So at the moment, for example, I know that on some issues I am in complete denial of. Complete I can't even intellectually work it out uh, on, on any level. Now I know on those levels, I've, oh, I've got a lot of work to go on those, on those things. And then on other things I know, wow, I'm almost done here because I'm just back, you know, I might be just back at this, we'll, we'll go backwards, just back at this point, you know, where I'm now starting to want to feel the cause within myself. Now there's only a few more steps from there, right? This is getting close now, I'm getting close. And it's so encouraging, you don't need anybody to encourage you because you know where you are on any of the issues that you might face. It's really good. That's why I don't need your encouragement. You can all attack me as far as I'm concerned, I'm still going to do the process because I know the joy I get from knowing where I am, understanding where I am, where I am on any single issue. I know what work I have to do, what work I'm yet to do. Like, it's really good. I don't need anybody to tell me. God's shown me a process that I've learnt over many years now. God's shown me this process. I've learnt the process now. It's in, it's in my soul now. I know it and I'm aware of this process. I can feel it inside of me and I engage the process. And I don't need anybody motivating me. I don't need anybody pushing me. I don't need Mary to talk to me about it. I don't need anything. Right? I don't need a spirit to tell me. I don't need to go to channel, you know, person channeling and say, you know, what is the next thing or any of those kind of things. I don't need any of that. I'm becoming a dependable, self-responsible being. I know exactly what I need to do, exactly where I've come from, exactly where I'm going. It's great, eh? Yeah. Ivana? I'm Ivana. Um, I was just curious, what, um, what issues are you in complete denial of? Um, the issues where I still have physical pain. Everybody who has physical pain is still in complete denial. Yep, that's me. Huh? Yep. So I have physical pain right now, right in here, just right in here. It's with me every moment of every day day and night, I know I'm not getting at it. I know that. I don't have good eyesight still. Yep. Another area that I'm in complete denial of. I don't even know what it's about. Not at this point. I can imagine I'm, I'm working my way through the intellectual process of trying to find out what it's about, 
trying to discover what it might be about. But it's just guesses at this point. Like, I, that's all I'm at. I'm not at the emotional process of it yet. Does that make sense? Yep. So you've had other physical pains that have gone away after? I've had, like, I, so, like I said to you, I was sick, and I'm not exaggerating, I was sick every, one week every month of my life, yeah. up until 33 years of age. Yeah. Right. I used to, like, I couldn't stand in front of an audience like this without ha popping a fair few histamines for antihistamines first and, and, you know, bringing up, you know, the reason why I still carry hankies a lot is because I learnt in my childhood that if I did not carry a hanky, there was going to be a disaster at some point. Because <laughs> I'd be not everywhere <laughs> from, from allergies and hay fever and whatever. Like, I was constantly in pain as a child. I had asthma up until I was 33 years of age. I had such chronic back problem when I was 30, right, that I had to lay in bed for six weeks because I couldn't move for six weeks. If I went jogging for any longer than five minutes, I would get so bad asthma that people have to take me to hospital. Uh, now, I go jog, I can not jog for six months, and Mary says, let's go for a walk or a run or whatever. I go for a run. I'm there going away, Mary. I'm fine, you know. Uh, Mary's going, ah. And to me, like, she's now going through the same things that I've had to go through. She's getting asthma and she can't do it. And, right? and I'm 51. I'm there jogging away. It's fine. So you will notice the changes in your body. You will. Like some, I, I notice things happen even with my body all the time. Like, like for example, late me, my eyesight's starting to change, right? So, so what's happening is that I've had to get a lower prescription of glasses. So I don't know if you noticed, but I've got different glasses than I used to have because I've got a lower prescription of glasses because of before my glasses, my eyes were now better than the glasses were before. But some days I have this big cry about some issues and some of them are related to self, like self-worth and everything, which I believe what is what this is all about intellectually. Um, and and I, I can see everything. It lasts for about 10 minutes. But I can see everything, like clear as a bell, far away as what you want. And all of a sudden the, it starts coming back, you know, like the old bad eyesight it comes back so that tells me I'm getting close I'm getting close and when I do that little bit of crying or whatever that's what it's about but I haven't got there yet I'm not willing to fully release right so I know where I am on that subject does that make sense other subject got no idea yeah. but I don't need Ivana to come and tell me do I because I know the process. So I know where I'm at in this process. Right? So, for so example, down here in this bottom area of my body, you know, where my bowel is and everything, which, by the way, has been my problem since I, like, I had operations on my bowel when I was two years of age, had a part of my bowel removed when I was two years of age, I know that obviously that's a very deep problem, right? Very, like it was there from the moment of birth, so it was obviously a problem that I got right earlier than earlier than birth. I was born with it, with a, con with a congenital defect in, in the bowel. And so I know that there's obviously a problem there that, I, that, I, that is quite serious, that I, that I need to get to, right? Now, I know where I am on it. Like, I, I'm not there on any of those soul-based awareness. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware there. So I'm not there, I'm not there, I'm not there. I'm, I'm probably there. I realise that I'm suppressing my, some emotion, right? I know it has to be emotional. I'm suppressing some emotion that's causing a huge amount of pain in my body that's permanent. Like it's there every day, all day. There's not a moment when it's not there. Right? So I know that's where I am. So I must be in the place where I'm not even yet aware of what it is. So I'm just working on this area. Like, what, 
I'm, I'm, I'm suppressing something and there's got to be a reason why I'm suppressing it. And that's a sin, right? Suppressing something is a sin. But I, but, I, but I feel suppressing it is obviously more important than realising it. Otherwise I wouldn't have the pain. All right, so I know that's where I'm at. So you don't need to tell me. Totally, totally clueless. I'm just beyond totally clueless about that. <laughs> I know that. That's okay. All right, Julie. When you're in the sleep state, though, mm -hmm. Jesus, mm -hmm. you can then see what is the problem. Of course. You can too. Oh, yeah, but so, I'm talking <laughs> with your pain, you. Yeah, but you can too. Does that help you? Well, no, I'm not Jesus in the sleep state. What, what's the difference? I'm just a person. You're just a person. There's nothing special about me. I'm a, like, I'm a child of God. You're a child of God. What, what, what's the difference? If you saw something in your sleep state and I saw something in my sleep state, does that mean that you're going to deal with it in your awake state? Well, only where I'm at is pretty low down. So... So this is I would a, have thought, that's all. That yeah, you, you're pretty unloving with your expectations of me, Julie. <laughs> Sorry. Honestly, yeah. Like, I, and I must judgmental be. it is. Well, I just, th well, I don't know. I just think you're well, so... Why should I be under different laws than you? Why, why should I have some magical capacity that you don't have or vice versa? I don't have any memory of my sleep state very much. That's the only thing. And Most I, of the time I don't either. Oh, Okay. Like, oh, okay. if I did, I'd be bawling all the time. Yeah. Because I remember sometimes and I wake up bawling. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I sort of just had in my mind that when you and Mary went over to your sleep state that you were yeah, yeah. obviously not where yeah, I think you were. Yeah, just one of your expectations, you know. Yeah. Expectations. 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 You have great expectations. Yes. I probably do. I mean, I do, yeah. Of me? Yes. But not the same expectations of no, yourself? No, I don't. So why would you have them of me? I don't understand. See, a person mm. who's ethical would not have more expectations of me than themselves. Yeah. So why yeah. do you have it? I don't understand why you have it, you see? I see you as a student of love with a lot more love than I have. That might be true, but how does that change your expectations? Yeah, no, they're just unloving. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you see, while a person may have more... No, there's heaps of persons at the moment in the spirit world, from a, not perhaps from a soul perspective, but, but in terms of conditional perspective, have more, know more about my body than I do. But to be frank with you, I have had discussions with spirits about this issue at some times in the past, and they've got no idea. Mm. And why don't they have any idea? Because they're not going through what I'm going through and they have no idea what, what the emotion is. They've never had to feel that emotion themselves. So they've got no idea. Right? I've, I'm doing something and Mary's doing something, all the 14 are doing something no one's ever done before. But you expect us to know what the process is while I'm doing it. No, I don't. I don't know. I'm just telling you the things I do know. Like I, I've had the benefit of going through the first part of the process, you know, the first incarnation part. And I know that. And I'm telling you what I know. But I don't know what in the hell I'm doing with the second part. Yeah. And how can I know? I haven't done it yet. Your expectation that I know in advance of doing it is actually very flawed from a logical perspective. Mm. How can I know something I haven't done yet? I don't. I only know the things I have done. But this is one of the advantages of you coming along to a, to a seminar of mine, is I can share with you what I have done, which is greatly going to apply to what you need to do. Yeah. But the reality is, I still don't know all the things I need to do to get back to the condition I used to be in. I don't know. Nobody's ever done it before. I can't, I can't ask anybody. The only person that actually does know is God, and God's trying to communicate with me, but I've got my blockages. I've got my sin to deal with. I've got to work through that. I've got to have a desire to work through, through that just like you do. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. 
So while I don't have to remember a whole, or I don't have to develop a whole heap of things that you have to develop for the first time, because I've already developed them, there is a whole heap of things that I am doing for the first time. They're just not things that you'll have to do for many hundreds, if not thousands of years, that's all. And you may never have to do them in the way that I've done them. Yeah. 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 So, so the key is to see that actually, why, why would I be any different to you in terms of what God desires for me to go through? See, I, I don't expect that of me myself. A lot of people do. You know, as soon as I say I'm Jesus, you know, there's high expectations then, right? Yeah. I know where I'm headed, though. I've been through the process once, so that helps me. But this is not a process. The, the clearing process I've been through once, but this process that I'm going through to become back to be the person I was before I came here, no one's ever done that before, including me. I've never done that either. So it's a discovery process for me. But there are things I have done before, which is what I'm sharing with you, this process. Yeah, I've done this millions of times in this life. Possibly millions might be a bit of an exaggeration. Definitely tens of thousands of times. Because yep, I've had tens of thousands of things to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. You see, this is a problem, is that many of us, um, we have all these presumptions, don't we? If you think about it. We have all these presumptions about what, Jesus should do what the 14 should do, why are they not doing it? You've got no idea the depths of emotion that the 14 have to go through at all. And it's pointless even trying to understand it because you're not in your second incarnation, so you're not going to understand it. You need to, do, to go through what you need to learn right now, which is what the first incarnation things that you need to work through. That's what you need to work your way through. But don't expect me to be different. I'm discovering a whole heap of new things. So in a way, I'm the same as you. They're just different things that I'm discovering. You're having to discover some things for the first time that others in, in front of you have already discovered. The difference between you and I is I'm having to discover things for the first time that no one in front of me has ever discovered. which is a much more difficult process. But I still have a lot more happiness about it than you do. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. Uh, when you look at a process like that, you go, oh, no, 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 right? And, and, and I'm looking at it and going, this is really good, right? <laughs> like we have a totally different feeling and concept about the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there we go. The process of deconstruction. How do you feel about it? Is it good knowing it? Like, yeah, I think it's great knowing it. The key now is, is, is remember this is all about education in love. This is what we're doing here, isn't it? So now what you can do, okay, I've been told about the process. But what I could start doing now is choosing a few issues and actually going through the process and working out for myself, where, I, where am I in that process? Ah, oh, that's where I am. And learning how to be honest with yourself about where you are in the process, learning how to determine where you are in the process is a fantastic thing for your own development. It helps you become the self-responsible being God created you to be. So that's a very good thing. Okay, so let's just, uh, whoops. That's true, huh? Seems to be a pretty hard process, doesn't it? And it is pretty hard in some ways, like. The facade self takes a lot of effort to deconstruct. The facade self has the most resistance to its own destruction. The facade self wants to retain itself. The facade self wishes to avoid painful emotion at all costs. 
sad self is angry and resentful towards God. So what's some homework for us? Okay. So number one, begin the process of noting down your actions out of harmony with love. So this is about identifying the sin. You see what we're trying to do? We're trying to help you. You start the process of engaging identification of the sin. Right? The unloving actions. Remember, anything out of harmony with love is sin. So we want to identify what's out of harmony with love. Ask yourself whether you're really willing to see the reason why you do those things. And be honest. You can look at some of the list and go, <laughs> I'm totally unwilling, right? To look at the reason why I did that, why I do that. Be honest about it. Honesty is the first point of contact of getting out of denial, right? You need to know where you are. You need to start where you are. Ask yourself whether you see your addictions and unloving behaviour as a sin. The majority of us don't. We see them as something we deserve to have, something we should have. We don't see them as a sin. We see them. As, we see the way we see it is the world's committing a sin by not giving it to us. Attempt to develop an intellectual awareness of the emotions driving those actions you've identified as a sin. Now this process is a process of education, intellectual education of yourself. Does that make sense to you? Process of intellectual education of yourself. You, get, you saw the example when we were dealing with eating meat. Well, you can apply this example. You saw the bit of the example of the process with regard to dealing with the emotion of not wanting to speak up. Well, you can apply these things to all sorts of issues within you. Treat yourself like a... Like this, remember, this is about understanding yourself, right? Isn't it? This process. Do you remember that? That was the theme of our talk, was understanding yourself, deconstructing the facade. So treat this as a way of finding out everything about yourself. So imagine you're like a, you know, an investigator who's trying to solve you. He's trying to solve, you know, why you do things, why, what goes on inside of you, what causes you to take actions that you take. You're an investigator. You, you go into it with that. No judgment. You go into it with this investigative desire to find out about yourself. Yeah. Okay? That's your homework. So I'm not even expecting you to even get to one emotional reason as to why you do it. <laughs> At this stage, all I'm asking you to do is to take some of these steps to identification of the sin. Okay? Good. Eye. What we'll do is we we'll just have a bit of a break, uh, just to go to the toilet and stuff, and then Mary would like to talk to you about helping you connect with your hurt self. But can I just say something, and Mary will say it as well? The hurt self, many of you are nowhere near there yet. Like this is where, where most of your work is going to have to be. But we wanted to give you some information about he helping you with the hurt self so that when you get to that point, you're able to work your way through what's going on. The deconstruction process of the hurt self is exactly the same as this, exactly the same as what we've been through. It's the same for deconstructing everything. So what Mary is going to do is talk to you about some additional pointers that will help you in the deconstruction process of your hurt self. Okay? Good night.